so a bit about myself. My name is Thomas Boifangel. I work at a company called Luna. I've been there for about four years. Um, before that, uh, I've been implementing uh, distributed systems in various companies since uh, 2004. Uh, event sourcing wise, uh, my experience isn't that long. W we started doing event sourcing about uh, a bit more than a year ago. Our first event source service went into production uh, around this time uh, last year. Uh, so we're pretty new in this space. Okay, uh, a bit about the agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a bit of a uh, context. Uh, what is Luna? I guess uh, most of you don't know what Luna is. Uh, a bit of history, uh, and the evolution of our tech stack, uh, which is important to understand why we chose uh, event sourcing. Uh, then a bit about what it takes to build a bank from scratch, primarily concerned about our tech vision. Uh, and it's this tech vision that has guided us in our implementation. And finally, we'll arrive at uh, event sourcing, uh, why and uh, we chose that, and uh, how we're doing it. Uh, a bit about some patterns we have seen emerge from uh, our implementation. And finally, some uh, challenges and learnings if you uh, yourself are going to uh, go this way. So, what is Luna? Outside of the Nordics, uh, there's not very many who know us. Um, we are a smartphone only uh, challenger bank founded back in uh, 2015. Um, meant to, uh, we are tried to disrupt the banking industry. Uh, so from the beginning, uh, at the start, uh, the business model was to build on top of an existing bank and then build our experience on top of that, providing uh, our experience uh, using the partner bank, but trying to hide the partner bank as much as possible. Uh, from the beginning, it's been in our DNA to deliver a best-in-class user experience and uh, also a best-in-class uh, support uh, of our users. We went live in uh, 2016, uh, and currently we're present in Denmark, Norway and Sweden. A few facts. Uh, right now, we are a bit more than 100 employees, uh, of which 25%, 25, 30, around that number, are uh, developers. Uh, we have 150,000 users who together produce uh, more than a million. Uh, it's probably uh, more like one and a half million transactions per month. Uh, our platform right now is made up of uh, 100 microservices ish, uh, we lost count. And we are running uh, free Kubernetes clusters on uh, AWS. So that's some facts. Here's a quick view at uh, the evolution of our platform. As so many other startups, we uh, started with a backend in uh, Rails uh, and a few Java components uh, with integrations to our uh, partners at, uh, at the time, the beginning. The backend was running uh, on top of Postgres, uh, managed by AWS, and everything was deployed in uh, AWS using uh, static Docker Compose. So I guess a very common setup for uh, uh, a startup that has to do something very quickly. Uh, since then, uh, a lot has happened. Uh, we're right now running a microservice platform, as I said. Uh, we've broken up uh, the monolith that adventure started uh, in the summer of uh, 2016. So as you can see up there in the corner, Rails is still there. It really takes time to uh, kill your uh, legacy. But right now, it's, uh, the size has, uh, it's very much more slimmer than it was before. And it's actually only acting as an adapter uh, into the Danish clearing system. We have a lot of uh, different types of services. Uh, sort of uh, grouped in core services and feature services and adapters to various partners uh, delivering part of our, uh, our uh, product. We're still in Amazon, but now uh, using Kubernetes in a GitOps style, uh, 
we have a very active DevOps uh, team who's also uh, doing a lot of uh, speaking about this. Uh, so we have a lot of talks about that. Um, and we have some open source projects around GitOps, uh, DevOps. There'll, there's some links later on. Um, we've added Rabbit uh, as a message broker. So all services communicate uh, using Rabbit. All uh, business domain events are published on Rabbit. We're still using uh, Postgres. Um, that's an example of uh, what Nat talked about earlier. Sticking with some boring technology that can actually be a very good idea when embarking on something new. Just use some technology that you feel good with. Uh, and we do with uh, Postgres. It's well-known technology and all services uh, are primarily using Postgres. Okay, so a quick assessment of that uh, uh, platform. It has uh, served us well. It has made our growth possible. Um, on the good side, uh, the microservice uh, architecture really delivers on its promise. We get autonomy to our teams. Um, we're running a Spotify-like squad model with the uh, autonomous squads, and they can deliver new features fast without uh, wrecking uh, all the other stuff. Um, furthermore, the standardization we've made across services and uh, the DevOps setup uh, gives us a very maintainable platform. Uh, the messaging part is also working very well. It's easy for services to uh, produce events and it's very easy for consumers to uh, start consuming and implement new features on top of already existing events. On the bad side, messaging again. Um, and that's because uh, we don't have 100% uh, delivery guarantees in the messaging due to some of the choices we've made. Um, so once in a while, uh, that causes some consistency errors, which isn't that good. Furthermore, all of our services, nearly all, are CROD services, uh, so we're updating state. Uh, once in a while, that causes some headaches when we have to figure out how did this user's data end up in the state, because we've updated it, so we really don't have uh, uh, the history of the state. Okay, so that's a bit of history, uh, which is important to understand what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so let's look a bit to the future. Uh, about half a year ago, in August uh, 2019, we received our own banking license. So we're actually going to be our own bank now, a real bank. Uh, the reason for trying to get uh, that banking license uh, is pretty uh, simple. It will give us the opportunity of providing a more complete banking experience to our users, uh, but also open up a lot of new revenue streams. Uh, we are funded by investors, uh, and at some point we should uh, hopefully be profitable. So uh, getting the banking license is um, a part of that journey. So the goal for, for this year is to uh, get our new banking platform up and running get all the existing users migrated and offer this complete banking solutions uh, to all uh, the Nordics, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and later on Finland. Right now we are in a closed beta, uh, about 10, 15 employees uh, running on the new bank, myself included. So I've been out in Amsterdam testing my new card, which has been extremely fun. Um, but, what does it really mean to be a bank? Well, we're in the middle. Uh, to the right, we have national clearing. And to the left, we have a card processor. So the card processor makes it possible for our users to pay uh, with a card. And the national clearing makes it possible to get money into your account or out of your account. Pretty simple. How hard can it be? Well, of course, it is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and the primary reason uh, for that is that we're dealing with people's money. 
So when we deal with money, there's a lot of regulation and also a lot of expectations. So ask yourself, what would you expect or what do you expect from your bank? Well, I certainly expect my bank to be trustworthy. I also expect it to be secure and I expect it to be correct. Um, when we started this uh, a bit more than a year ago, uh, we knew we, we were applying for this banking license, so we started slowly thinking about what should our platform be like. So we sat down some developers and uh, we could all agree on this. But we dug a little deeper into this and our conclusion was that beneath these words there's something else. Uh, or at least we think that there's another property which will enable us to get these characteristics. So that single property ended up as uh, our tech vision. And that property is traceability at all levels. So nothing should happen without us knowing and our system should never be in a state we cannot explain. That's what we have seen happening in the current platform. Um, so we really want never to be in a, in a situation where we cannot explain what happened. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll come back to how this is actually going to deliver on the other uh, characteristics. But first, let me uh, dive a bit more into this traceability at all levels. So uh, in the era of uh, microservices, Kubernetes and uh, the likes, uh, traceability has normally or is normally understood as distributed tracing. Tools like what uh, Open Tracing and Jaeger Sipkin can, can provide uh, in the observability space. Of course, that's really important and we also want that. Uh, we want to be able to trace across service boundaries and across uh, asynchronous boundaries uh, have uh, distributed uh, uh, logging which we can manage and, and search through. But we want our system to provide a bit more. So to us, traceability does not equal distributed tracing. We don't want uh, this uh, traceability to depend on developer diligence, to have the right lock statements, uh, provide the right spans for the, for the uh, tracing, etc. We want it to be intrinsic, something which is built into the system by design. So let me take a little detour. Uh, this code snippet, uh, with a bit of editing, uh, I've seen this a few times uh, in the code bases I've uh, worked on. And more than once, uh, a support case has ended here. Trying to figure out, well, how did that actually happen? I thought it was impossible. How did it happen? S head scratching, searching of logs, trying to figure out what happened. So let me see how many others have been in that situation. Halfish, okay, great. Um, no matter what your answer had been, I have proof that I'm not the only one. Because if you do a search on GitHub for this phrase, this should never happen. <laughs> have you tried to do that? I guess not. I have, and the result is <laughs> more than 500,000 code results on GitHub where we have this should never happen. That's quite fun, uh, I think. Um, but, well, yeah, so that sort of proves to me that I'm not the only one having that uh, learning. And what can you learn from it? Well, my learning is that production is the place where the impossible happens. If you can think of some very unlikely situation that could occur, but yeah, probably not going to happen. 
at some point in production, it is going to happen. And even worse, impossible things you think are really impossible, they'll also happen at some point. So, this is precisely what we mean by this traceability. What we want is an intrinsic property which can explain cases like this, explain the impossible. No guesswork, no head scratching, no searching through logs, just something built into the system will which will tell us this. So that's my definition of traceability. So in the face of errors, um, we don't want to have to say to our supporters, well, uh, we really don't know what happened. You have to say something like this uh, to our users. That's not a good situation if you're a bank. We want to be able to tell our supporters that, well, um, we know we have an error here, but you can say this to the users instead. Something happened to your money, but we know exactly where it is, and we're going to fix it. So that's uh, where we want to go. And uh, this uh, leads us, of course, to event sourcing. Otherwise, I wouldn't stand here. Because we think that uh, by its very definition, event sourcing has some of the properties which will lead us to this. So the very idea built into event sourcing will support this. Often, uh, event sourcing is uh, thought of as just a different way of uh, persisting state. However, there's more to it than that. There's a shift of focus. So you shift the focus from the state to the events. So instead of thinking about what state is this entity in, you think of what has happened historically. And then the state is a byproduct uh, of all those events. And it's this very shift of focus which is exactly what uh, we want in order to achieve uh, inherent traceability. And the main reason we chose uh, event sourcing. We want to shift the focus onto what has happened in the system instead of the actual state of an account or a user. So, um, we decided on uh, trying out event sourcing um, and just, well, we've already heard earlier today that uh, event sourcing right now is in a place where we're all trying to figure out what is this, uh, find the right words for, for things and, and agree on the terminology of, uh, uh, of the subject. So just to make sure that we're all on the, on the same page, um, this slide will, will be a presentation of what an event sourced uh, component or uh, an event source service in the Luna setup, what it consists of. Um, some of you, it'll be pretty basic, but maybe uh, there's also someone in here who will actually take something out of this. So, first of all, uh, the fundamental uh, thing is the event stream. Uh, so, we store that in some storage. Um, it has a, an important property. It's an ordered sequence of uh, events representing what has happened uh, in the system. We structure and organize our event streams around the uh, uh, obvious uh, domain entities in, in, uh, uh, in the domain. Uh, so we could have an event stream for user, one for an account. Uh, but also, we're also using event streams to represent um, the act of doing a transfer or the act of paying some uh, payment slip, uh, something like that. So those streams are very short-lived, uh, whereas users and accounts are, are long-lived uh, event streams. The next thing is, of course, the projection, and as we just saw, uh, for those of you who were here before, it's just a fold left over the uh, events in the stream. Then we have the concept of an aggregate route. 
Uh, the aggregate root is a well-defined entity in uh, the domain. Um, it's technically made up of uh, an event stream where we store all the events happening to this aggregate root and a projection to uh, hold the current state uh, of the aggregate root and then some business logic. The business logic is uh, the right API uh, of the ag aggregate root and it protects the integrity of uh, the entity. Uh, so it's the only way we can add events to the underlying event stream is through this business logic, the command handlers of uh, the aggregate root. And it's pure functions, just as Jeremy uh, showed before. Uh, this uh, piece of uh, code has two inputs, the command, and the current state, and it can do no side effects. It can only do one of two things, either fail the command if something is not valid, uh, you don't have uh, money on your account, uh, for example, or it can publish one or more events. Nothing else, no side effects, which makes it very easy to test this logic. But of course, we also want to be able to do side effects. So uh, the side affecting things is all in the handlers, the event handlers. So a handler will get uh, uh, an event from the event stream when uh, a new event is added. And this is then where we can do side affecting behavior. So the side effects could be calling some external system, publishing a message, uh, or uh, looping into the system itself and uh, executing a, a command on a different aggregate. So that's basically what our event source services are, are made up of. Um, so what about the implementation? Uh, yes, I probably didn't say it, but we are primarily, we've ended up being primarily a Go shop. Uh, we started our microservices in uh, TypeScript with Node, but uh, now everything new is uh, written in Go. In uh, GoLand, uh, we did a sort of looked looked around for uh, for event sourcing libraries uh, in Go. There's a few, but none of them are maintained by more than one or two uh, developers. Um, so we actually ended up uh, writing our own library. Uh, actually, we did it twice uh, because uh, the first version wasn't really what we wanted it to be, so we did it over again. Uh, we are planning on open sourcing that. It's not not completely ready for, uh, for the rest of the world yet, but uh, hopefully later this year we'll open source it. Um, we chose another, another choice of borrowing technology, just stick with Postgres. Uh, so we're just using Postgres as a, a uh, JSON storage, uh, the content of the events is just a JSON blob and then there's uh, the sequence number and uh, a timestamp and uh, ID of the event. That's everything we need. Uh, then we're using in-memory views for the aggregate routes and SQL back views will uh, come later, hopefully this month. So this is very, very new. Um, all I'm going to say for the rest of the talk is just out of development. So in two months, we have maybe changed to s something different. Uh, and now, uh, just to be able to uh, actually show some code, uh, I had hoped that we had already open sourced uh, Apogee at this uh, point. Well, didn't happen. So uh, the only way I can show you some code is uh, on slides. Uh, so this is fr taken from an example, which is in the uh, library itself. Um, the top part here is, uh, it's a to-do list example, a very simple example where we have a to-do list and we can add items to it and we can check items and archive items. Uh, so a bit more complicated than the light bulb, but uh, not much. So the top part is uh, the state. Uh, defining the current state of the aggregate root. It only has two properties, uh, a timestamp when it was created and then a map of the items and uh, the item state. It only contains just enough 
to be able to determine uh, the action. When we get a command, we should be able to determine is this a valid action or not. Uh, then here's an example of an event, just a, a struct. So an item uh, has been checked. It happened at some time and then an ID of the, the item. And down here we have the uh, application of uh, an event to the uh, state. So that's simply looking up the uh, uh, item in, in the map of the items. Check it and put it back. Yeah, uh, in Go, if you don't know, Go is not good at immutable things. So you have to get used to that. This is mutable. So it's not like uh, in the in F sharp, as we saw before. That's what we really like to do, but you have to code around it in, uh, in Go. And here's then a command handler. So all the command handlers uh, are defined as uh, uh, methods on, on the state. So we get the parameters is uh, uh, the command, and we have the current state. So the Apogee library will take care of loading uh, the state um, when you call this. So you get the state at this point in time, uh, and the sequence number that the state corresponds to is then also encoded in the unit of work up there. So the unit of work functions as uh, the transaction in the e event sourcing system. Um, so we do some checks. Uh, if it's an empty uh, item ID, we fail. Uh, look up the item in the current list of items. Uh, if we can't find it, well, then we also fail with a specific failure code. Uh, if the state is already checked, well, nothing to do, just return. Else, we publish a new event. Um, very much like what we saw in the talk before. Um, yeah, so that gives you an impression of uh, what this, uh, our library is. Um, and hopefully later this year you'll you can actually use it if anyone is interested. So that was the code I was going to show today. Okay, so in order to make uh, an event sourced application work, uh, we need one crucial property, guaranteed event handling. The handlers are crucial. That's where we have the side effects, uh, the thing that makes uh, the application tick. So we need to be able to ensure that all handlers will get all events in the proper order and with as low latency as possible. So how can we implement that? Well, uh, first we thought, well, we can probably do that inside the library. So it's something like keeping track of how far have your event streams come and how far have your handlers come and then just making sure that uh, you always uh, get all the events to the handlers. Uh, that would give us more complexity in the library, so we try to look out, look around for different ways of doing that. Uh, you could do a, a more generic outbox pattern where the events are put in an outbox and something else is taking care of publishing that and uh, an inbox on the other side uh, taking care of that the events will actually be propagated to the handlers. Uh, but we'd really like to, to find a piece of technology we can just more or less pull down from the shelf and uh, um, and then use that. So uh, last month uh, we did a, a, a proof of concept using uh, Debesium uh, with Kafka. So if you don't know what Debesium is, it's a, a CDC, or a Change Data Capture Tool, which will contain uh, the database and uh, publish all changes uh, to a table uh, on Kafka. So right now, this is how we think we are going to do this um, and guaranteed event handling. 
Uh, the table is very simple, and since we're only appending, the only type of uh, change that will be there is an insert of a new event. So th the model is really, really simple. So we just have to uh, subscribe to uh, uh, the Kafka topics uh, and make sure that the handlers will then get these uh, events. There's this thing about the order, but you can control the partition key based on what's in the table. Uh, and inside the same consumer group, you get uh, the proper ordering. So that's how we think we're going to do that. Um okay, so that actually uh, leads to uh, the patterns. Patterns we have seen uh, come out of our implementation. It has been very much a uh, uh, trial and error process. We we've been implementing various uh, parts of, of, of the new banking platform and then these patterns have uh, emerged. So the first um, pattern concerns uh, public APIs. So if you think back to the very, very uh, simple drawing of uh, what a bank is, we had us in the middle and national clearing to the right. Uh, so this is that part of uh, uh, the drawing. Uh, in reality, we have the banking core, and then there's an adapter. Uh, because this API up here to the national clearing, um, that's typically some old piece of te technology over here. In Denmark, uh, there's a bank central here sitting on a mainframe where they have put a REST API on top, or REST. Um, it's REST with uh, a lot of weird behavior coming from the actual mainframe. Um, so it's a synchronous API. So the, the, the model in, in our new ba banking core is that uh, for each of the different national clearing systems, we'll have an adapter. And this adapter will then communicate with the bank core uh, asynchronously. And in fact, the banking core will know nothing about uh, this part. So the adapter is the one executing stuff uh, and also receiving stuff from, from the clearing if money goes into the account. So this part, how can we uh, expose a public API between uh, the banking core and the adapter? Um, the inside, on the inside in the banking core, uh, we have the internal event stream. It has some really nice properties, uh, an ordered sequence of events. So we'd, we'd really like to have that property on the outside as well. But, of course, we shouldn't expose the internal event stream. That's our internal state. So, uh, who was it? Who was it? Yeah. Uh, one of the other talks, it was stressed. Never! expose the internal event stream. It's your dirty underwear, right? Um, so the way we are solving that is um, by producing an external event stream based on uh, the internal event stream. Um, so it's essentially a handler writing to an event stream. And we can keep track of uh, the source events on the inside in order to to uh, guarantee this traceability that an external event that we publish somewhere, we can trace that back to what uh, internal event led to this um, external event. So here's a small drawing. So we have the an internal event stream, a handler, maybe a projection if we need to keep track of some state in order to be able to publish uh, the external event stream. And on the right, uh, here we have two event streams on the outside. We have the possibility of exposing several derived event streams. Uh, this one has fewer events than on the inside, so it's a more focused uh, event stream. And the top one has more uh, events. Um, so uh, there's a, in this case, there could be a, um, a requirement uh, that you have to invent 
uh, another type of event based on uh, one of those. We actually have that when uh, uh, when you withdraw or do something on the account. Uh, we'd like to actually publish a balance changed event. That's not in here. In here we only have transactions on the account, but on the outside we'd like to have a balance changed event for uh, someone else to listen to. Uh, now the balance was changed on, uh, on the account, so this handler will just invent a new um, event based on the internal event stream. So it also gives uh, uh, a way to do uh, versioning of uh, your public APIs. You can just add a new one and consumers can then uh, switch over to uh, the new um, external event stream and at some point you can then deprecate the old version. So this pattern of using external event streams for all the communication, um, that's how uh, the banking core and the adapters are communicating in, in both ways. So the adapter listens on uh, the banking core and uh, the bank core listens to the adapter. That's how we do this communication asynchronously between the, uh, the parts. So the next pattern is uh, distributed flows or distributed transactions or sagas. Uh, we represent that as aggregate routes. Um, actually, the aggregate routes uh, here are used to represent a state machine where um, the state represents how far we have come in this process of doing some distributed flow. The state of the aggregate route determines which action handlers should take and of course all side effects are in the handlers. And as I said, we're using the public event streams as uh, API. So um, here's a quite elaborate example. Uh, and this is actually how we have implemented transfers. So here on the left, we have the bank call. And on the right, uh, the adapter, in this case, the Danish adapter. Inside the bank call, we have uh, the, the account, long-lived uh, aggregate route. And up here, there's a transfer aggregate route representing the act of doing this transfer. Likewise, uh, in the adapter, there's a transfer aggregate route representing its side of uh, this distributed uh, flow. So a request comes in from the user, uh, which will be validated on the account. And uh, let's say it's valid. That will then publish uh, two events on the account uh, at get root. Transfer initiated and funds reserved. So we do a reservation of uh, the money you want to pull out of the account. So you cannot use that money for anything else uh, from that point on. Up here, we then have that handler, which will get this event and cause an action on a command on the transfer uh, aggregate uh, to initiate this transfer. So now we get an initiated event on the transfer aggregate inside the bank, uh, inside the bank uh, core. And another handler will grab this event, publish uh, an external event on the external event stream. It's not included here in order not to clutter in between here, there's an two external event streams, one from the banking core and one from the adapter. So uh, after step three, we don't get any more events on the inside, but we have an event on the outside. Then in the adapter, a consumer will uh, get this event, cause a command on the uh, transfer aggregate inside the adapter. Now we have this initiated. A handler will get this event based on the state of uh, the transfer aggregate. It will do whatever it must do in that case, which is, of course, try to do this transfer uh, in the clearing. 
So let's say that times out. So uh, the request timed out. We really don't know what we should do, but uh, we store that results in an event timed out on the transfer aggregate. That event will then uh, read the handler again. Uh, and the behavior when the state is timed out is, of course, to retry. So it'll retry the action again, and let's say it succeeds this time, then a succeeded event uh, is added to uh, the event stream. And now we have to go all the way back, right? So a handler here publishes a succeeded event on the outside. The consumer uh, in the banking core consumes that event, causing a succeeded event on the transfer aggregate uh, inside the banking core. And finally, this handler will then uh, handle that event and um, execute the transfer completed command on the account aggregate. This will then give rise to a transfer completed. Then we'll remove the reservation because uh, now uh, the money shouldn't be reserved anymore, but instead there's a transaction created event. And uh, this will then propagate up to, uh, yeah, Outside of the picture here, we have a, a transfer service actually handling the request from the app. So uh, it'll get that event and the action is then completed in the app. Yeah, this slide is only there for completeness afterwards. Uh, we have all the numbers and all the events. Okay, so uh, some key takeaways. Uh, Again, guaranteed event handling is extremely important. <laughs> if that fails, then the process stops. So down the line, we have to have some uh, metrics on that to be alerted if something goes wrong. Uh, it's um, extremely important uh, for us to, to get that uh, uh, done. But um, we get maximum traceability. All uh, that goes on as part of that transfer uh, is recorded as events in, in the various uh, aggregates taking uh, part of the, the flow. And of course, errors are going to happen at some point, remember, production. Um, but we can see those errors directly in uh, the aggregates. Which leads me to uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about our, uh, on our implementation, uh, error handling. Uh, failures are first-class domain citizens. Failures are not exceptional. Um, we strive to, on to narrow down um, the part of errors which should be treated exceptionally. Just as um, in some languages where errors is just another value, it's just another type, it's not anything exceptional. For example, in Go, uh, there are no exceptions. You just have an error as a value. So we try to treat as much as possible failures as just part of the domain. It's something you should expect happen. So your domain should also treat those errors that you expect to happen as first-class citizens. Um, furthermore, item potency is crucial, uh, both in our own internal APIs, uh, the transfer service that was over here, has to be able to retry the request uh, towards the banking core. Uh, if, if we have a timeout inside our own platform, well, the only thing it can do is try to uh, do it again. And rest assured that if it actually went well, then, well, you'll just return the same result and not do the transfer again. But we're also depending very much uh, on the external API from the clearing that that's item potent. Um, if we don't have that, 
then we are really on thin ice uh, when we get timeouts or, or crashes. We have no way of knowing did it actually uh, occur, this transfer, or not. So uh, fortunately, uh, the clearing system guarantees that for us. Uh, if we didn't have that, we, we would have to uh, figure out how to, after a crash, uh, after a timeout, have some read endpoint where we can read, did this actually succeed or not, and then take action based on that. Okay, so let me go back to a bit to the tech vision and uh, revisit this. Um, what about the other properties? Uh, correctness and uh, consistency. Correctness. Uh, I hope you'll agree with me that 100% uh, correctness is uh, impossible. So, what can we do? Um, we can do our best, uh, test our software as much as possible, but even though we test, uh, we'll make mistakes. So, what we think is that, well, if you can understand your errors, then you can also fix them. If you don't understand what has been going on, then the chance of correcting it is uh, a lot less. So that's how we think that this inherent traceability will enable us to eventually get to a correct system, one error at a time. So if we can understand the errors when they happen, we can fix them in the system, fix the data, do whatever is needed uh, in order to fix it, go back to our code, uh, make a test, and fix the code. So that's what we mean by traceability leading us uh, to correctness. And furthermore, in event sourcing, uh, error correction is not different from what you do all the time. The only way you can fix an error in event sourcing is by putting another event on the event stream. So uh, compared to uh, the CRUD services where fixing something in the state is doing an update, uh, we can always go back in event sourcing. Uh, if uh, the correcting uh, event you put uh, in the stream turned out to be not completely correct, well, you can just add another one which isn't the case in a CRUD service. You might not be able to go the other way uh, after you've done the update. And consistency. Well, this is where the ordering of the event streams uh, is important. We think that uh, by exposing uh, external event streams which have the same uh, properties as on the inside, an ordered sequence of events that actually empowers the consumers uh, because now they can reason about the events they receive. If they receive, a uh, consumer receives event number 10 and the last one is always number 8, then something is missing. If that occurs, well, we could uh, actually also empower it to be able to retrieve the old events. If we put an API on top of the producer, or somewhere else where we have the events uh, lying. Um, we could put an API on top of that uh, and enable the consumers to actually retrieve uh, whatever events it ha uh, hasn't seen yet. Of course, the only thing we can guarantee is eventual consistency. But that certainly is a lot better than what we have in the old platform, which is maybe consistent. And in the old platform, the consumers uh, have no means of reasoning about the messages uh, um, they receive because we don't have this ordering uh, of events. Okay, so um, I'm nearing the end of the talk. Um, what's left is some of the challenges and learnings we've had uh, during our implementation. Uh, first, and not very surprisingly, uh, event sourcing is a perfect fit with the DDD. 
uh, together with the event sourcing part, we also started doing DDD in a more formalized way, and the things fit nicely together. But uh, it's a different mindset. When coming from uh, uh, services, which are CRUD services, uh, you really have to wrap your head around this way of uh, thinking. Um, we didn't do DDD uh, in the CRUD world in a formalized way. We thought about uh, the domains made up by the microservices, but it wasn't really uh, formalized. Um, in the implementation of the banking core, we've tried to actually also adapt some of the practices uh, from DDD. Um, it can also, especially in the beginning, when you uh, start doing this, cause some uh, mental overflow, wh where you, you have to implement a certain thing, but you have really no idea how to do that. And uh, you have to do a lot of searching and figuring out uh, how to actually implement this using this tool set you have available. So you certainly have to leave room for uh, experiments uh, and failures. That's how we learn. Uh, try things out, fail, and try again. Furthermore, um, we, at least up until now, we really think that uh, event sourcing delivers on this promise of uh, traceability. Um, we went live with this closed beta uh, about a month ago. Um, so since then, we have actually been um, using the system for real. And it's such a relief to be able to look at the event stream and see, oh, uh, that happened, that happened, oh, here. Here's what went wrong. Um, but, and there's a but uh, on all the slides here, it's not necessarily mainstream tech, depending on uh, your tech stack. In our case, uh, in Goland, um, it certainly isn't uh, mainstream. Uh, in the .NET world, it's a lot better. Um, and, the part about guaranteed event handling, that's a challenge. Uh, you have to figure out how to, to achieve that. Finally, um, we've also learned that there's a tremendous power in these immutable event streams combined with CQIS. Um, but immutable data can also be a challenge in itself. What about GDPR. Uh, fortunately, we are in the f uh, uh, financial space, so we are actually allowed to keep a lot more data for longer uh, periods uh, of time than uh, anyone else, which is nice. Um, but we <laughs> eventually have to f figure out how to handle that. Um, and if your event streams are immutable, hmm. at some point we have to look at migrations, uh, migrating event streams, and that could be uh, also an idea uh, of uh, dealing with GDPR. Uh, we have already done this, compensating events. Uh, that's the only way you can do corrections if something went wrong. Um, so you have to implement some uh, tools or handles to, to be able to, to do correcting events on top of your uh, event streams. Yeah, and with that, I'm actually done. Uh, so here's a few uh, links uh, to our uh, tech site. Um, we have a blog where we try to write about what we do and a uh, collection of talks. Um, I have some colleagues in the DevOps team uh, that are really active in the the community, they've been out uh, speaking at uh, KubeCon and uh, other conferences. And we have uh, some open source tools, um, DevOps focused right now, but that's also where Apogee will eventually uh, have its own life. Um, so take a look at it. My slides will be up there, if not later today, then at least tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>